question by now, Melissa, you've done your poll regarding the four shirt when I was in New Zealand, and it got uh, published in the uh, Oregon magazine. And the woman who was the executive director of the museum sent me a message thanking me for <laughs> putting the, the Suquamish Museum on the map, uh, not only in New Zealand, but also throughout the publication of uh, the Oregon magazine. So. That was kind of fun. I, I actually didn't make I didn't make the connection until she did. <laughs> so it's there you go. Just you know, by serendipity. So, well, welcome to number three. Um, and today we're going to spend the campaign. Some of the things that you might do to carry out a campaign should you decide uh, to mount one. Um, and I know it's, I know that, you know, the idea of mounting a campaign can be kind of a, a scary. It's like, wait a minute, you know, we're going to launch a campaign to raise X number of dollars to build this building, this cultural center or a library, whatever it might be. Um, but that's really when it, when it boils right down to it, that's what it takes. It takes somebody saying, we're going to launch this thing. We're going to get started. Um, and I know I've told you more than once that Ron Charles, who was at that time chair of the uh, Port Gamble Skalalum tribe, was like, can we really raise this money? I'm, I'm not convinced we can raise $5 million to build these four buildings. And, you know, he would, every, turn he, every chance he got, you know, Don, are you sure we can raise this money? Uh, and it wasn't until the uh, fourth building, the library uh, grand opening, that he finally said, yeah, we, I guess we can raise the money needed to, to make that happen. So um, it's, that, it's that making that step. And so today we're going to talk about some things you can do to help move a campaign forward if you, if you need, if you choose to make that, make that step. And let me see if I can find my presentation. I'm a little bit discombobulated, as you can imagine, when the, <laughs> when the whole thing goes, goes down. It's like, what's going on here? Um, yeah, I'm going to go to sharing a PowerPoint, that much I know about. I'll bring that up. There it is. And we'll go over here to Zoom meeting and bring it back to full screen and then share it. I think that'll work just fine. And please, again, please, questions, uh, raise your electronic hand or, you know, wave. I won't be able to see everybody, so if you have to interrupt, I'm okay with that. I really am okay with that. I teach college, right? I teach I teach college classes. So trust me, I'm used to being interrupted. And I want to make sure that we're get, getting you all the information that you, you need to go forward. So there's the title slide. Um, we'll go here. And from the beginning. And now we're set. And yes, it's implementation methodologies for conducting a successful capital campaign. And here's all the good stuff about me. Yes, yes, he does like, I've done all kinds of crazy things and yada, yada, yada. So you, you can see that when you need to. But here's what things we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about preparing staff and volunteers for a capital campaign, developing compelling publications. And remember from last time, we talked about the three Ps, publications, people, and policies and procedures. We'll talk a little bit more about those uh, in a minute or two. Executing a public relations media campaign. And we call that creating the context for a campaign. We wanna create an environment for giving, as we say. <laughs> That's kind of a catchphrase from our industry is that we wanna create an environment for giving. So you use the public relations media campaign to accomplish that. Approaching funders and acknowledging them. Of course, that's pretty much key to any a successful campaign, and then looking at special events. What are the kinds of things that you should be thinking about when it comes to special events, including your grand opening? And just briefly touching on that, because there's some things that we need to really focus in uh, over the course of the presentation. So those are the items that we want to touch on. Um, if there are things that we didn't list here in the overview of the presentation, feel free to let me know. You know, it'd be nice if you have time to add this topic or, or that topic. And so, important part, but there's some tools or some things that we've talked about that lead up to that campaign plan. And so part of that is, is using uh, this process. And part of what we've, ta we've talked about this 
uh, already, right? We've talked about uh, community assessment. Um, but one of the things that might precede a community assessment is an organizational review. Now, what's that involve? Well, here again, what we would do for an organization, we would come in and do an organizational review or assessment of the group to determine what kinds of things, what steps might be necessary to make them competitive. And we would look at their marketing materials, look at their computer systems, look at all their financials, their articles and bylaws, all the things that would make up uh, a review of the organization. And then we would provide a prescription for that organization that would say, here are some things that we've identified that might make uh, your organization more competitive for fundraising activity. Um, and then the organization can take that prescription and use it however they choose. Some groups will take that prescription and just run with it. It will take care of all the steps you've recommended. Other groups will say we could use some help with steps one, two, and seven, for example. Uh, but that's a good place to start. The community assessment, we talked about that quite a bit in the previous session, so I won't focus too much on that. There is that whole master planning piece. And uh, each of you probably are at a different place when it comes to master planning. When we work with a Swinomish Indian tribal community out near where I'm at, um, there wasn't much of a master plan. And so part of our engagement with them was to develop a village master plan and in which we developed a cultural district, a government district, a business and light industrial district, um, and, a, and a housing district. So these were districts within the village that pretty much laid out how, what kind of emphasis would be given to each of these things. And of course, that cultural district was where we were looking to see if there might not be an additional, uh, additional cultural buildings built within the cultural district. And of course, there were uh, areas within the, re within the reservation and within the village that were uh, sacred to be protected at, at all costs and no development could be, could be handled there. We've talked about the representative and foreign board. Uh, that's, and we talked about the contemporary strategic plan. Uh, we've mentioned the idea of feasibility studies. I will say at this point, there are two kinds. There is a project feasibility study that takes a look at the project. For example, we did a project feasibility study for the Western, for the eight Western Shoshone tribes um, in Nevada and, and in adjacent areas, uh, determined would a cultural center be a feasible project? Uh, the other kind of feasibility study is a campaign feasibility study. And we did talk about that previously uh, when it came to um, is a campaign to raise the money needed to build these buildings, is that campaign feasible? So two different kinds of feasibility studies. Talk about those some more. But here we're going to get up to the campaign plan. And I'll, I'll be talking about it, that in more detail and showing you some examples. And then the business plan. And the business plan sort of looks forward and says, okay, yeah, we built this building, or we're planning to build this building, and um, now what's going to be the business plan for our museum? What's going to be the business plan uh, going forward? And um, I mentioned the business plan because there are instances where the funder will say to you, before you've, before you've broken ground on, the, on your museum or cultural center, we won't donate to your project unless you already have kind of a preliminary business plan in place. Uh, without that, we're not going to make a, a grant or a contribution. So sometimes that happens actually before you even, you even uh, begin construction. You're looking to develop that as part of your grant application or your funding application. And again, just a review because uh, we didn't get a chance to go too much into detail with these, the policies and procedures, the people and the publications. We'll be talking about those uh, people and publications in more detail. Let me just spend a little bit of time on policies and procedures. And <laughs> here's a little cartoon that I found. It says, does anyone know where, the, uh, where we keep the unwritten rules? Right? <laughs> um, and that's sometimes part of the process when we know that there are kind of rules, if you will, that we, we operate under, but they're not written down, then how do you take those into consideration? So I want to just spend a moment here um, 
refocusing on policies and procedures. Let me open that up and share it with you. There they are. Okay, so this document basically is an example of policies and procedures. And again, we didn't get a chance to talk too much last time, so I just want to spend a little bit more time introducing you to these so you'll be able to understand what I mean when I say campaign policies and procedures. And again, this is part of the infrastructure of a, of a campaign. That's part of getting the campaign up and running, but it's also something you're going to be using over the course of the campaign to kind of maintain uh, uh, you know, discipline, if you will. So yeah, the idea number one here is a campaign fund, a separate campaign fund. And from the donor's point of view, that's really important, right? It's important from the standpoint that their dollars that are going to be donated to your cultural center are not going to be commingled with other tribal dollars or other foundation dollars they're going to be specifically assigned to a campaign fund. So in this case, we had the thing called the Suquamish Foundation Campaign Fund, also known as the fund. And any donation, when somebody wrote a check for $1,000 to donate to this campaign, they would memo that, you know, the, the you know, Suquamish Foundation Campaign Fund, uh, so that the accountant would know where to put those dollars. Um, in the case of Suquamish, they said donations are welcome from any source. They didn't place any restrictions, but they did say donations with conditions. That is, if the donor said, I'll give you $1,000, but I want the kitchen named after my mother, uh, those kinds of things would have to be reviewed by the Foundation Board of Trustees. Um, the donation types and processing. They made their donations, of, you know, they, you could use a MasterCard, Visa, uh, American Express. You could donate your securities or your stocks, bonds, fine art, payroll deductions, and in-kind donations. All those were welcome. Um, and so they tried to make it as open as possible when it came to how a person could donate. And we, we did have some people that actually donated appreciated stock uh, to the campaign. And, of course, we had at that point then to open a, a, a brokerage account so that the tribe at the foundation could accept that gift of stock. So um, some things to think about from a technical standpoint, I don't want to get too much into the, to the weeds, but you know, the idea is that you need to be prepared if someone comes in and says, yeah, I've got some Microsoft stock I want to give you. Okay, I'm going to transfer the shares to your brokerage account. And the response is, we don't have a brokerage account. You don't want to discourage your donor from making that kind of gift. Um, and then a whole series of rules about how, how, how long can you keep the check. Uh, we, had, we had a story where the woman had a $5,000 donation to a campaign. She decided to put it in her glove box and lock it for safekeeping, and she forgot about it. And about 48 hours later, the donor called and said, did you guys get my $5,000 donation? And they checked with the woman who had made the request for a gift. Oh, I, I, I locked it up in my glove box. I forgot about it. I'll bring it right in. Well, that's not a good way to encourage people to give. So you want to be sure you have rules about how soon people need to turn in the gifts that they receive. Uh, acceptance of gifts, a whole series of kind of rules and regulations about that. Uh, donor confidentiality. It's really important that people be reassured that their information that's generated over the course of a conversation about their donation will be kept strictly confidential. So, you know, hey, I, I you know, my stepson, you know, da, 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 that's not for other people to know. It's really important that things that are shared during these conversations are kept confidential unless the donor uh, is willing to say, oh yeah, you can, you can tell people that you know, I've made my gift and I want others to make a gift. They can be some ways of encouraging that. Uh, donor recognition, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But in this case, the, the tribe foundation made the decision that any gift, $1,500 or more, will be on a donor wall, right? So that was the threshold. You had to give at least $1,500 
before your name was on the donor wall for the for this these campaigns that were being held and that was that was consistent throughout um, and you'll notice also that names of any donor were going to be put into a donor book so that every donor whether they gave 50 bucks or fifty thousand dollars they were all going to be in that uh, donor book but only those at a certain level would be on a donor wall and the, the, they also gave themselves a the permission to name an individual who had not made a donation and acknowledge their gift of time or their that brought this campaign together and they could acknowledge them and, and, and on the donor wall without the benefit of a gift. Ethical considerations, of course, you don't want to create undue pressure on, make, on, on someone to make a donation. And if they say, well, I need to talk to my CPA, right? I need to talk to my CPA or my lawyer or whoever, make sure you give them, you know, feel, they feel confident. Yeah, oh yeah, you feel free to check with your CPA and get back to us. So that's policies and procedures in a nutshell. And I, I know you have a copy of this in your material. I just wanted to kind of highlight those sections a little bit more so you're, you're familiar with what I'm talking about when I talk about uh, uh, policies and procedures. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. That's easier said than done. <laughs> Okay, there we go. And let's bring the power pack back, back up. All right. So let's talk about getting your campaign up and running. And this idea of a campaign plan, it's a dynamic blueprint for the campaign. That's important, that word, I underline that word dynamic for a reason. This is not something that you create and go, okay, well, that's done. It's, the, it's a done deal where it's going to follow the plan. The plan is going to adjust. The plan is going to adjust. It will. I mean, like I say, the, the campaign at Suquamish that produced the Early Learning Center, the Longhouse, and the museum was a five and a half year campaign. So don't misunderstand me. It's not something where you, you create a campaign plan, you're gonna be evaluating it on a regular basis and modifying it uh, as needed. And so when you look at the campaign plan, excuse me, um, the, the various components are, what kind of campaign is this gonna be? And that may seem kind of, really? But yeah, is it a capital campaign? Is it a campaign to help fund programming? Or is it a comprehensive campaign that might also include an endowment? So let me just touch on that a little bit more. A campaign, a capital campaign says we're raising funds solely to build this building or renovate this building. And as a result, that's the focus, right? Um, and that may make sense. It's like, yeah, we're just going to raise money to build the building and you know, that'll be fine. Except that in the course of a capital campaign, the question is going to be, like I mentioned last time, how are we going to fund operations and maintenance of this new building? Or do we need to raise money for programs that are going to happen inside the building, right? And what, you know, or do we need some additional dollars above and beyond the money we have to run programs inside the cultural center. So some groups go with what we call a comprehensive campaign. It includes capital, it includes, could include program, and it also could include uh, endowment. And the endowment says, we're gonna raise $100,000 in endowment and have $5,000 uh, uh, income from that $100,000 every year to spend on whatever the needs of the organization and the building might be. So that endowment pays, a typical rule for an endowment is a 5% payout rule. That if you have 100,000 in your investment account, you will spend, be able to spend about 5% of that per year. When I was at Centegra Alaska uh, uh, University, uh, we actually got a $100,000 gift from United Parcel Service uh, for 100, you know, $100,000 and then generated $5,000 forever. And that's the beauty of an endowment. The other thing to think about is sort of the constituency goals, right? 
what are the what are the things within your constituency within your community that are that would be supported uh, when you think about the goal for your campaign again capital program or uh, comprehensive uh, the key constituencies include your board your past board members we I put in alumni in quotes because you may you know it may not be an educational institution but those people who have, have in, the pre, in the past received benefit from your programs and activities of course tribal members customers of your current facility uh, and, and, and the community more broadly. These are the folks that can help uh, articulate what might be the, uh, the goal for the campaign. So here's an example of a campaign plan. Um, what are the components? And as you can see, there are quite a few different components that make up a campaign plan. Um, Part of that is just a description of the plan. What, how do you describe the plan? And oh, by the way, in your, in your handouts, you have a number of uh, examples of campaign plans, including one from a hospital. And just be aware that the one from the hospital might not seem like it's all that relevant to a tribal project, but it is a very comprehensive uh, handout. It gives you a lot of good information that I won't be able to cover necessarily in the, this presentation. So that's why it's included. It gives you the sort of the reasons, the whys, the wherefores that might be, um, might be helpful to you uh, as a reference material. The other thing is that if there's time, I'll spend some time looking at an actual sample uh, campaign, campaign plan so you'll be able to see the actual language of the plan. But this whole about this plan, the benefits of a capital campaign uh, are identified in this campaign plan the requirements for a capital campaign. So you're introducing your potential donors and your volunteers and your board, of course, to the requirements for a campaign. A gift range table, I won't spend a lot of time on that, but a gift range table basically takes a look at your, your goal. Let's say it's uh, $2 million just uh, off the table. The gift range table tells you the, the quality of gifts, the, the number and quality of gifts that are needed to raise $2 million. So you might have, for example, one gift of $500,000, 10 gifts of this much, 15 gifts of this much. And when you put all those uh, into that table, you identify the quality and number of gifts that are required to raise your goal. That's what a gift range table does. And it's a very useful tool because it can also kind of develop the different levels of giving. And when we do, a, when we establish the levels of giving, let's say that that, that $500,000 gift, that one $500,000 gift you'll need to raise $2 million, that might be considered a nucleus gift, or you might give it some special designation. Um, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But the idea of what are the quality of gifts? And then if you're going to go ask this particular donor for that one $500,000 gift, you might ask him or her or them for a nucleus gift. That is a gift to kind of get the campaign started with one quarter of the campaign goal. Of course, the campaign timetable, all an important part of it. And we'll look at a campaign timetable in more detail in a little bit. Um, but these are the, and maybe these, the, the timetable sort of develops a sense of the phases of a campaign. And the first phase is the organizational phase. It's infrastructure and leadership development. Who's going to be part of the infrastructure? Back to the three P's that we talked about. And who will be part of the leadership of the campaign? Let me check. Do we have questions? Okay, so people are checking a little bit out about the links. Um, and I think Melissa will be able to give you the link to the documents that I'm speaking about. Okay, all right, so. So the campaign committee organization, the chair and vice chair 
we'll talk about this in more detail, but what's typical is to have an honorary chair or more than one honorary chair. Now, an honorary chair could be a distinguished elder that you want or honor in that way. It could be, we, sometimes we have what we call the office of the honorary chair. And what that means is that you may have three people that you identify as honorary chairs. And you know, when we do this kind of thing, we give them a letter, we send them a letter and say, would you consider being an honorary chair? And we identify four key responsibilities of an honorary chair. One is to allow us to use their name, to allow us to use the connections they might have within the community or within the funding community, um, to, be, to participate as best they can in uh, events that, were, that are put on, and to otherwise be supportive of the campaign. It doesn't mean that they're going to be on a campaign committee. They're not going to be meeting on a regular basis with the campaign committee. They're going to be honorary chairs. And so these are people that may not have time to meet on a regular basis, but they will, give, they will lend their name. And the good news is, I, I found anyhow, that oftentimes the people who are honorary chairs will go beyond what we are asking of them. They'll say, hey, no, I want to come to the special events. I want to be part. I'll, I'll sign letters asking for support. I'll be active, more active than perhaps we thought. Um, the campaign committees are also part of the campaign plan. Uh, briefly, the campaign committees, there are four campaign committees. One of those is called a research committee that helps identify potential donors. Another is called a special events committee. Um, a PR committee is a third committee. And of course, the fourth committee are the, are the solicitors, the people that are doing the actual solicitation. You also want to create an organizational chart so people are very clear about um, you know, how the campaign is organized uh, and showing these various components of the campaign organization. The financial systems are something you'll want to think about because oftentimes the financial systems will, will be linked to the tribe's financial systems. And so that will, be, that will be something you'll want to describe there. If the foundation is going to be the focus of the giving, that is, if the gifts are going to go to, the, to your foundation, then what will happen is you'll be talking about that financial system within the foundation as it relates to the accounting system in the tribe if you've contracted between the foundation and the tribe to provide accounting services. So that will be part of that description under that section. We've talked about policies and procedures, and of course that'll be built into this campaign plan. The campaign publications can be a lot of different publications, uh, including the case statement, which is there on that next, uh, next item. One thing I'll say about campaign publications is you have to be kind of flexible. We, I will, we'll, I'll show you uh, down the road an example of a case statement that we did for Port Gamble. Um, and we started out with a 12 page uh, document, but we then also, we also developed a four page document. And we also developed a three fold document, a kind of a much smaller version. So 12 page ca uh, case statement that we use carefully with, with major donors or those we thought you know, needed that kind of publication. Then the four page was a little less formal, but it could be something that could be handed out and then the three pay, uh, the threefold uh, leaflet, if you will, that we could leave leave behind at service club meetings or other places, and didn't have to worry about spending substantial dollars on that 12-page full-color uh, case statement. So different publications, and you want to make sure from a, a from you want to be economic about not having to pass out a four dollar fifty cent 12-page full-color document to everybody who, who shows up at, at a service club meeting. Um, other parts of this, of course, you're gonna be talking about the whole pledge card receding process, uh, donor identification and research work that you're doing, the committee descriptions. That's something that's really helpful because in this campaign plan, if you're asking somebody, for example, to join the research committee, there'll be a place within the campaign plan that identifies what their responsibilities might be. So that's a good part of the, of the campaign plan. And again, if you're looking at this going, well, I'm not sure I understand what he's talking about. We're gonna, we're gonna look at a, a brief sample. You have in your, in your linked materials, some very detailed examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, phase two is 
planning, cultivation, and solicitation of gifts. After all, all this is put together, right, now it's time to go out and ask for money. And that has to do with uh, solicitation strategies. How are we going to go out and raise these dollars? And what's the timetable for making these asks over the course of, let's say, a two-year campaign? It's not unusual for a relatively modest campaign to have it be a two-year process. Um, of course, the follow-up phase, phase number three, is also described in the campaign plan, announcing the campaign in the public phase. And that's a really important thing for you to take into consideration because the rule, the, the kind of the rule of thumb is you don't announce your campaign until you have about 45% of the goal in hand. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't, you know, you can imagine if you decide to do a campaign and you go to out, you know, make an announcement, hey, we're going to do a $2 million campaign and you have a media event, for example, and they say, okay, okay, you're doing a $2 million campaign. How much have you raised so far? And the answer is zero dollars. <laughs> uh, that's not a good way to kind of kick off your, your campaign. Uh, it's not a way to encourage others to get involved. So we call that a private phase. The, you know, this, the, the planning uh, solicitations timetable has a private phase where there is no public announcement, but you are raising money. And once you have that 45, that magical 45%, then you have an announcement of the campaign. And when they ask you, you say, oh, we have almost half the money in place. And, oh, okay, all of a sudden people are getting enthusiastic. Why 45%? Well, mainly because 45% says, yeah, you made a good start, but you're not 90% where the campaign's already over, or you're not 0% where the campaign hasn't got started at, at all. So you're finding that happy medium. And it, you do have these announcement messages that are built into your planning. And of course, the post-announcement publicity, you want to you really drive home the fact that you have 45% of the money and you're moving forward on that basis, that you want to give that a lot of uh, media, uh, including social media, to help encourage others to get behind the campaign. Phase four, it's not exactly, you know, you don't do this after the announcement of the public phase. You can have special events interspersed with a lot of your different activity, your campaign activities, but it's typical to have a major event, you know, at that point as a way to help kick off the public phase of the campaign along with the supporting events. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit down the road as well. And of course, the post campaign, that's, it sounds like, okay, phew, we're done, uh, what, you know, what's next? But the post campaign, especially when it comes to donor relationships, working toward establishing ongoing donor relationships is really, really important. If you just go, okay, thanks everybody, we're, we're done, we can't, we've got a, our campaign's done, the building's been built, we cut the ribbon, all right, just take a big break and walk away from any of this kind of activity, you've lost an opportunity to keep that relationship warm, them back to the facility. And I'll tell you some more things about how that worked at the Longhouse uh, at Port Gamble. They took advantage of that and it worked out really, really well. So the timetable, I, I talked about the timetable, right? So again, this whole idea of um, developing the materials, we'll talk some more about that in, in a minute when we focus in on the, on the publications piece. Again, this idea of the quiet phase for major donors, you want to go, the rule has always been, go to your most friendly funders first, right? So you're asking for major donors to come in Next is the sort of board insider phase, you know, and here's the thing, I, I want to be real candid with you. It's really important, it's, let's say you've got a foundation board, it's really important that that foundation, 100%, 100% of that foundation board donate to the campaign. You're going, what? <laughs> right? We have members from the community who don't have a lot of money or a lot of resources. And I understand that, but the reality is that if you go to an external funder and say, we, our board has not 100% donated to this campaign, uh, that can be an issue with the outside funder. And the, again, the rule here is a comfortable gift from your board and other insiders, comfortable gift, right? And I'm sure I mentioned the example of the guy that gave 
$32 a month to the Longhouse campaign at Park Gamble. That was 10% of his $320 Social Security uh, check. And that was a powerful, powerful gift. $1,800, $1,800 over three years against a $5 million goal in the big picture, maybe not that much money, but that sacrificial gift that he gave was a powerful, powerful indicator that the community wanted that first longhouse in 100 years to happen at the, at the Port Gamble uh, Scholar Reservation. The public announcement then would happen once you gathered both the major donors and the, the board and insider gifts, staff, others who are gonna give, and then the public phase, right? But this one, this is suggests that the community and the foundations and corporations would get involved, acknowledge that you wanna start working on the foundations and corporations before the public announcement, but you may not make your grant requests of them until that public announcement has been made to get them involved. And then of course, the other part of the timetable is the celebration and recognition of every gift that's made, whether it's in a donor book uh, that includes every gift or it's on our donor wall that might include gifts of a certain level and above. Okay, so the key things you wanna think about is helping the donors to think big by giving them an inspiring vision. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's, more, it's more than just the building, right? It's, it's the impact that the building will have on, I, I think I mentioned last time, the kids that were up at the Shell Station doing the gang signs and wearing the bandanas and all, that longhouse that poor Gamble brought them down to the carving shed where they, the teenagers, said to the elders, teach us our songs and dances, teach us our language in a way that will allow us to be active members of the longhouse community. That's huge. And when you tell people, especially external funders and internal funders, that that's really part of what you're trying to accomplish Again, the building is good, the building is nice, but that impact is the vision that you want to help them acknowledge. And then talking about that from the standpoint of, hey, you know, we're this, the Port Camel Skalalum tribe is the, is the organization that can bring this longhouse to the community. It is the, it's the appropriate, along with its foundation, the tribe and the foundation are the appropriate organizations, right, to be bringing this to pass and to help sustain Mary John's dream of 30 years. And then using external credentials, when does that mean? Well, it talks about the idea that you have endorsements. For example, it would be unusual for the Burke Museum, who was, you know, okay, holding certain materials to endorse and support the idea of transferring those materials to the Suquamish Museum. That's, and that, that relationship you know, yes, there's always going to be an edge there for how are these materials acquired. Those are issues that, you know, have to be kind of worked out. But the reality was that both the Port Gamble Skalalm Longhouse, that 35-foot uh, panel, was displayed at the Burke and then transferred to the, the Longhouse. And materials that were Suquamish materials that were at the Burke were being were transferred then once the museum was completed. Those That, that can help uh, with external funders. Okay, the case statement, right? The case statement is the main statement that you use to share the case. Why should I give to this campaign, right? And the mission statement, you know, like I say, I, I've talked about this before, you have to have a clearly articulated mission statement. Uh, another component of the case statement is the history of the organization and its service to this area. And if you're a new organization, like a newly formed foundation, you may also, of course, want to talk about the tribe and its longevity <laughs> over eons and eons of time within this area. The vision statement, uh, also important. The environmental assessment, we talked about that last time as a part of the planning process, but it does, it does give you an idea of what's, what, what's the environment in which this campaign is being conducted. And of course, the area of need, typically could include things like program support, new programs. I've highlighted new buildings because many of you are thinking about it in those terms, but it could also be administrative operating needs, current and future. I talked about the idea of endowment. And then of course, matching funds for future or pending grants. 
could all be part of a, cam of a comprehensive campaign if you blended all those things into a campaign. You, again, you have, to get, you have to be very careful about what are the areas of need that this particular campaign is focusing on. And you want to be sure that you have clarity around that before you launch the campaign. It, it's kind of tough. It's kind of tough to sort of add one or more of these elements to your campaign once the campaign's been launched because it confuses people. It's like, wait a minute, you, you weren't talking about an endowment, now you are talking about an endowment. So it's better to get these things resolved within your case, within your campaign, and of course, within your case statement. Um, and of course, you don't wanna have to republish things by adding new, new elements of the campaign that gets kind of spendy, especially if you're dealing with full color materials. Another thing that's important, and I don't want to skip over, is the whole indicators of success. And that's important, from, especially from the standpoint of external funder, because have you, have you have, do you have a record of success? Uh, for example, the museum at Soquamish was the one that was previously uh, organized uh, in, in the old tribal building. Well, it had, it was, it was acknowledged it was an award-winning museum. And so it's likely that if you expand it from 3,500 square feet to the new 9,000 square foot museum, that's an indicator of success, that the, that the, that the materials and the operations will, and the success that that smaller place had could also then be transferred to a larger place. Uh, plans for operations and future funding. Again, I can't emphasize that enough. The problem is that funders have put money into buildings and then the building closed or it wasn't used as it was intended. So what is the plan for now funding this new facility or this larger facility? And that's, again, I don't want to skip over that because that's a really important part. The case statement also talks about the mechanics uh, uh, of the organization, including uh, the budget, that kind of thing. Um, the campaign plan, campaign plan, but just a, an abbreviated version of the campaign, campaign plan that kind of illustrates that you have the plan in place and how it's going to work. Uh, if there's a kind of a special campaign fund that's you know, it's going to be dedicated to a, a portion of the effort, uh, they identify that. Of course, again, you're going to talk about how, what kind of gifts are you willing to accept and how will these gifts be, accept, will be acknowledged? What are considered major gifts and how will you name them? That's also included in the case statement. Um, of course, you're going to have graphics files and lots of materials that kind of give this case statement a life. And I'll show you some examples of that as well. Um, and then any particular PR materials that you want to build into the case statement. Um, and here's an example of uh, a case statement that we did. You can see it's pretty rich when it comes to the text. Right, it's pretty rich when it comes to um, the graphics. Notice the petroglyph uh, used as a as a uh, sort of a backdrop uh, to the to the case statement. This is a sample four page, which is also included in your materials. You'll see over here the naming opportunities for the facility uh, that was primarily at the Longhouse. We identified the project team, how you can participate. And I want to talk a little bit about the naming opportunities because in tribal settings, that becomes a pretty uh, sensitive, can, can be a pretty sensitive uh, issue. Um, oftentimes tribal communities aren't prepared to call the main hall at the Longhouse, the Bank of America uh, hall, you know, Grand Hall, right? <laughs> that just doesn't feel right. It doesn't, you know, and, and so one of the ways to address that is to suggest that this, this is the, well, I know it's a Quamish, let's call it, we'll say the Chief Kitsap Hall at their longhouse. So the Chief Kitsap Hall to honor one of their uh, honored people and underwritten, that Chief Kitsap Hall underwritten by Bank of America. That way the focus is in on the individual uh, that's being honored within, within the history of the tribe but it doesn't, it doesn't put that focus in on the donor that provided that support. At the museum at Suquamish, um, there was an elder, elders and youth talking circle. 
that was funded by the McEachran Foundation. Okay, that was a $40,000 gift that was restricted to that elders youth talking circle. It's actually not a circle, it was actually a square, a, a, a subfloor square where elders and youth could come together and learn, uh, the elders could tell stories and teach the young people. Um, that was, you know, that, that, was, that was simply named the Elders and Youth Talking Circle, again, underwritten by the McEachran Foundation to give the focus where it needed to be. So the naming opportunity is something to think, think about. And the more detail you have there, the better off you're gonna be. You wanna have those naming opportunities clearly artic articulated right before before you begin your campaign you don't want to go back and develop those so next thing beyond publications is looking at your volunteer groups right you need to have participation uh, of your volunteers um, and it makes a huge difference in terms of being successful i mentioned proudly that again poor gamble had almost 100 volunteers. And half of those were native people and tribal members for the most part are natives living on or near the reservation. And the other half were non-native people from the Hansville and adjoining communities who stepped up and said, yeah, we want to help the tribe raise $5 million for these buildings. And that made, 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 made a, you know, people stepping up that way made a big difference when it came to uh, developing uh, these particular uh, projects, including the library and the the elder center. So again, campaign leadership, just to give that a little bit more emphasis. Uh, Co-chairs are, are not unusual. If you're not able to identify somebody who will take on that role as a chair of your campaign committee, maybe you can find co-chairs that will share that responsibility. Uh, I remember Glenn Pascal at Squawkson uh, served as the tribal member a chair of the campaign committee. Uh, he was an excellent chair and had really good leadership skills, a Vietnam era veteran, uh, did a great job. And he also led the effort that I mentioned before for the Veterans Memorial. He, he, once the campaign was complete to build the museum at, at, at Squawkson, uh, he led a, a campaign committee to, to raise the money to build, and, uh, to build the uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, Veterans Memorial. The campaign committee, again, orientation of the campaign plan. It's one thing to have the plan, but it's also important that you work with your campaign volunteers so they're intimately aware of and familiar with the campaign plan. And of course, this whole idea of cultivation uh, solicitations training. Now, why is that important? Well, I'm going to give you a story. Um, we had a campaign up in, up, in, up in this area, actually, where I'm in the North Cascades of Washington for $13.5 million to build an environmental learning center at a place just not too far from here called Lake Diablo. So this beautiful $13.5 million environmental learning center and the chair of the, of the board of the not-for-profit came up to me in private and said, um, Don, I find this whole fundraising business distasteful and I'm not going to participate. I won't be a part of it. And you, <laughs> you, know, you can imagine my, my response is like, wait, wait a second, $13.5 million, uh, the chair of the board doesn't want to be a part of it. And I said, okay, well, hold off before you make your final decision and come to our approaching funders training. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Come to the approaching funders training and then tell me how you feel. So she went to the training. She went to the approaching funders training. And you know what? She was the very first one up to the podium saying, okay, I got it. I got it. I'm ready to go out and raise money. So wait a minute, aren't you the woman who told me within the last few weeks that you didn't want to be a part of this at all? And of course, the big difference was it wasn't she didn't want to be a part of it. She didn't know how. And she didn't want to embarrass herself by going out and doing something she didn't understand. But once she got that training, now she was ready. Now she's ready to go forward and help us raise money. And she did. She raised a lot of, of money using the techniques that we helped her learn. So you're going to find people who say, ah, no, I don't, I don't do fundraising. Uh, 
uh, and, and maybe that's, that's, what they, that's their point of view, but oftentimes what they're really saying to you is, I don't know how to do fundraising or solicitation, and if you teach me, yeah, I'll be willing to go out and, and ask for some money to help support our cultural center. We did that cultivation and solicitation training for Suquamish four or five times. Some for people who are new to the campaign, who joined the campaign later on, and some for people who just wanted to take it again to help kind of learn and relearn those techniques. And of course, part of that building that volunteer core is the whole idea of, of getting together and supporting people who are part of that volunteer group. What, what can you do to help you know, show your appreciation for them volunteering? So what are the roles of volunteers? Well, they're especially, you, you know, you, they're uniquely able to go out and talk to people that they know, right? If you've got an individual who says, you know, I know this individual well enough, I could go out and ask, okay. But oftentimes you'll want people to go out in teams. You don't want to send people out necessarily as individuals. And sometimes you'll have people say, oh, I'll just take care of it. But the point is that by sending people out in teams, if you've got somebody who's really good at asking for money, they can help encourage maybe somebody who's a little more uneasy about that. And once they've had some success, then you know, they'll be able to go out in another team and help uh, raise the dollars. Uh, sharing information about prospects. If someone says, yeah, I know, I can, you know that same campaign I told you about, um, we sat down with them in the first meeting and said, oh, well, who do you know that's got money? And the response was, none of us know anybody. And finally, one of the board members said, you know, I know somebody from the Pearl Jam Rock Group. And I went, oh, really, like a, like a groupie or a roadie? Or, no, no, I know a member of the band. Well, guess what? Pearl Jam did a benefit concert for that environmental learning center up at Lake Diablo based on that connection with that board member. So they can, they can have knowledge about people that might be, uh, might be willing to consider making a gift. And then working together and, and being part of the whole process of introduction, cultivation, uh, and of course, stewardship of the funds that are raised. That's also a really important part of it. And it's always going to be a question about who's going to do it, right? Who's going to do it? <laughs> and uh, part of that, who's going to do it is, you know, having enough people to make, you know, to go out and carry out the work. Of, of, of the campaign. And sometimes that'll be volunteers. Sometimes you may, be, uh, you may think about asking for others to you know, go out and purchase support uh, from cons a consultant or others. Uh, and then of course, taking into consideration that the, the, how, how does the tribal council get involved, right? Do they have a role? Uh, and don't, think, don't, don't uh, discount them as people that might have those kinds of, I know a guy in Minneapolis that can help us work on this, or I know somebody at the Bush Foundation, or I met somebody you know, at this organization that might be able to help. At the, at the outset, you don't want to discount any potential because you'll be surprised sometimes at the connections that people can make. And this idea of regular communications, frequent, frequently communicating with your, with your volunteers. I mentioned, I think last time the, the, at Port Gamble Skalalem, we had quarterly, quarterly dinners for all those volunteers. And we, we had probably at least half of that hundred folks show up. And we had the gooey duck stew, stew and the fried bread and the cake and salads and juice and whatever. And we brought them in and we told them what's going on with the campaign. Here are some successes that we've had early on. And that would really encourage them to continue to be involved in the campaign. So this whole idea of marketing and PR, right? And this is just a little way of thinking about doing marketing and PR that I've developed that work, works really well. One of the things you want to think about are what are the objectives? What are the objectives of your marketing? And, and then the message, what message are you trying to share? Uh, what audience are you trying to share that message with? And what modality will you use to share that message? with that particular audience. And then evaluation, of course, just says, how will you know your measure objectives? So this marketing PR piece of it is really important 
and like I say, we think about it as creating an environment for giving. <laughs> I know that sounds like a catchphrase, but you can think about it as creating buzz, right? We want, we want, bu we want people talking about this effort to raise this money within the community and within the broader community. Hey, why do I keep hearing about this, this tribal foundation? You know, I, 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 I'm always, I look around, I'm seeing these various references to this tribal foundation. Why is it becoming so prominent in the community? It's because you're doing the marketing and PR necessary, right, to kind of tell that story in, in a variety of ways. And that's what this little, that's what this little paradigm of marketing PR does for you. So if, for example, you know that you don't know, people don't know much about your new foundation, you might have an objective of increasing recognition. You want more people to know about you. you know, and you might set an actual number or set a certain goal or objective around having your foundation be more, no, more not noticed or more, more people are more aware of your foundation. Um, and the message might be, hey, there's a new foundation in this community that's dedicated to uh, culturally appropriate buildings and the education and, and, up, and then learning that can come from those buildings. And then who is your audience? Well, if your audience is young people, right, then you may want to think about electronic modalities, uh, social media, uh, uh, TikTok, <laughs> uh, these various modalities that you would say, that's the best way for me to share uh, information about the foundation with the younger audience. So you, you, you can adjust the modality or in the case of an older audience, no, I'm gonna use a mail out to the older audience because they'll be able to learn better from a, from a letter that I send them. So you adjust the modality to reflect the audience. And of course the messages remain consistent over as you go out and, and tell the story of your campaign. It's a very useful tool, and I will tell you, we've used this in a number of settings. It's a very powerful tool uh, if you choose to use it in that fashion. So <laughs> my message is, well, yeah, Don, that's great. You've got a big, big marketing budget, but marketing doesn't have to be expensive, right? You can use community gatherings, which is kind of a natural thing you would do. If, if you have ongoing community gatherings, you can use that, you ask for, you know, asked to use uh, part of the agenda to tell the story of, of what you're trying to do with your campaign. I've been to a lot of community gatherings. I've been to a lot of dinners um, and served a lot of soup uh, during those gatherings. So taking advantage of those um, is an easy way. You, know, you can bring in uh, signage, signboards, handouts, uh, just again to get people generally familiar uh, with what you're trying to accomplish and why it's important to them. Uh, reader boards. Yeah, uh, with the one campaign that we did, um, we were going to do the campaign in the fall uh, or a little bit you know, later in the year. So in April, we went out to all the, all the businesses, pardon me, in the community that had reader boards, like this one that you see in the picture there that says, ride your bike. Well, we asked the dentists, we asked the, the, the service station, we asked the, the grocery store that had reader boards, could we use your reader board for one week, just for one week? And every reader board we could acquire uh, had, a, had a, a similar message about this, about this organization and its campaign. And it started creating buzz, it started creating buzz going on and making brief speeches or presentations to service clubs. Another way to talk about it and create that buzz. Faith communities, you know, could we have uh, some time during your, you know, I know some faith communities have a fellowship time after the church service. You know, could we have some time at your fellowship time to talk about what we're trying to do with the campaign? Uh, using a uh, reservation or on or near, on or near reservation not-for-profits like vets groups and others. I know when we work with the Colville Confederated Tribes there in North Central Washington, we helped create the Rodeo Club, the Veterans Club, other not-for-profits as a part of an overall federally funded uh, grant. Um, and those veterans groups, the Rodeo Club, were all people that would be interested and willing to hear about a, a campaign like that. Established outlets. You know, the Squawks and Tribe, for example, puts out a weekly newsletter 
to every member at, at their mailing address? Can you put something in the newsletter about the campaign? So it doesn't need to be, you know, Madison Avenue big time campaign to create this buzz that I'm talking about. And it's a good way, it's an important way to get people aware. If people are, if people feel re removed from the campaign, uh, then obviously they're not going to be as open to donating uh, to the campaign. Uh, another thing, of course, is this whole idea of, of prospect management, right? You got to have prospects. You got to identify potential donors uh, to your campaign. And there's a lot of techniques that we use to do so. The research committee that I talked about, that's one of those four committees. Uh, oftentimes in our practice, we'll take on responsibility for doing the initial research. And then the research committee will be trained to go out and identify additional prospects. And we'll, tell, we'll show them the techniques that we use to identify prospects. Um, of course, the first thing to look at is those who are currently donors and friends of your organization or are people that have supported the tribe or tribal organizations in the past. Those are the ones that might be willing to consider um, you know, asking for support or being asked of support. Prospects, prospecting with your board or campaign uh, uh, committee or council, you'd be surprised by the number of times I've asked people, have you asked your board for who they might know who would support this? And what we do is we have what's called a research night and we have pizza, uh, pop, or you know, just a light meal. And we, we have a no wrong answers, you know, free floating, free flowing, facilitated conversation. Uh, of, we're going to look at individuals and families, corporations, foundations, associations, government, and other organizations. And we've got big white, you know, white sheets up on the wall. And the beauty of that process is no wrong answers. So if somebody says, yeah, hey, Bill Gates might donate to this, we, it goes up on the wall. And then we take those and we sort of sort them out and we add additional prospects to the list. And that becomes sort of that initial prospect list. And we sort, we sort through those to identify the, what we call first tier or tier one uh, prospects. And it's called prioritizing the prospects. What's their capacity? What's their readiness, to, or that prospect's readiness to give? And do we have somebody that might be able to call on them? Oh, yeah, I know Jake. I can go with somebody else and ask Jake to make a gift. And then, of course, this whole idea of, uh, what's the strategy for us to go forward, um, you know, and some kind of visual progress. You've seen this, right? You've seen the thermometer going up as the Boys and Girls Club fundraising increases, something that shows big visual progress in the community that it also is a way of prospect management because it encourages those who are seeing some growth um, in, the, in the giving to also make a gift. Um, again, you know, this idea of focusing on the vision beyond, you know, the building is a, is a nice thing. It'll be a beautiful, beautiful thing to add to the community. But what's, what is, what's the vision? And again, Dorothy John's vision of the first longhouse in a hundred years uh, was a powerful vision uh, uh, that, that we wanted to be sure people were aware of. And, and using those kinds of, using the kind of, of graphics can also make, uh, make that process work. I'll think I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, giving prospects something to touch, um, models, that kind of thing are, are expensive, but if you have the resources to create a model of the, what the building might look like, they can also be very powerful. Uh, a, a virtual tour um, for people who are considering making a gift but can't come to you, a video tour, Again, not inexpensive, but they are a way to, to show people what it might look like, to give them that hand, more or less hands-on experience. Um, and then, of course, being sensitive about when your prospects are ready to be, for, to be actually asked. Recognize uh, that in our, donor, in our approaching funders training, um, we're not going to make an ask that first time, first time, time out. So using graphics, like this is a, this, these are graphics that you saw, for example, this petroglyph was part of that case statement, but this was also part of that case statement, the burning of these buildings. And I mentioned before, unfortunately, 
uh, 14 longhouses burnt to the ground by the Navy and the Army uh, in the past, in the 1870s. And that was this fire, this picture, this graphic that we found made that, that, that unfortunate history a very powerful experience for people reading the case statement and also being aware of the vision. Just real quickly, I want to walk you through the approaching funders training. Uh, this is something we would do in about a two and a half to four hour time frame, and it includes a training process. But the most powerful part of this approaching funders training was the role playing, because we asked people to take on the role of a funder or the role of a seeker. <laughs> All right. And it actually got to be fun. It got to be fun. I'm going to take a moment to shift over to my, my technician says that I can use the, um, I can use my uh, high speed internet now. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and shift over and hopefully it doesn't, it doesn't uh, cause any problems. Okay, are you with me? <laughs> Hopefully we're still together, right? Susan, are we, are we together? All right, so there we go. All right, great. <laughs> I was like, oh gosh, I don't really want to do this, but I also don't, I can't use all my, all my uh, hotspot time. So, the thing we're going to learn about in this approaching funders training, and I'm going to watch my time, uh, approach your most friendly funders first. Uh, and I mentioned the example where we went to a, a group called the Ferguson Foundation to ask them for a gift. They gave $7,500 to a $19 million campaign. But their gift, that gift, by, that small gift by the Ferguson Foundation, encouraged others to make substantial donors. And be just aware that certain prospects will be able to contribute more than others, and that's okay. But initial contributions will encourage others. Yeah, they will. And I bet that's been my experience. They will encourage others to contribute. So that's important. Um, identify your team for each uh, request for a gift. Who should go out and talk, right? You know, if you have a relationship with that prospect, if your volunteer has a comfort level that says, yeah, I'm willing to go out and talk to Rick and his wife, Susan, okay, whether the team might be more persuasive, uh, we really encourage teams to go out as opposed to individuals. And then, of course, organizing your visit, call in advance, call far in advance, and be clear about why you're asking for the appointment. It's not a hide the ball thing. You know, hey, we, we, got, we want to talk to you about something happening. It's really important to our community. No, we're out looking to raise funds for our cultural center. And we want to come and talk to you about this. Find a comfortable place and time for the visit. That's really important. You know, and, and maybe that, you know, that restaurant, you know, kind of a hangout restaurant is not your best choice. Because you're going to be talking to them at some point in the interaction, maybe not the first meeting, but maybe in that second meeting, you're going to ask them to consider making an investment in your campaign. So uh, office or home, probably a better choice than the local Denny's or, you know, the, the local hangout. Comfortable place and time. And, and another tip is you don't want to ask them, hey, what, could you meet with me uh, sometime to talk about this campaign? No. Now, hey, uh, Rick and Susan, I've got some time on Tuesday afternoon and Thursday morning. Would either one of those times be convenient for you? It's kind of like talking to your kid saying, hey, you know, do you want to wear a shirt today? You don't want to ask that. You want to wear your red shirt or your red or blue shirt. And then you kind of hone in on the choices that they have. And if Rick and Susan say, oh, yeah, Thursday morning would be convenient, then you've got that focus. But this open-ended question, can I, can I come talk to you about, uh, uh, you know, raising money for the cultural center sometime? That's going to lead to, oh, I'm really busy. I, I can't find the time. And of course, you want to send materials in advance. You'll send your, your test case statement or your case statement to them. 
and indicate you're looking forward to meeting with them. Getting ready, be sure you identify, you review the donor guidelines, the prospect information that you have. We provide a toolkit for every team that goes out with information about the organization, of course, the, the campaign. We give people talking points uh, so they have the key things. And ironically, there's almost always seven questions that prospects ask. So we prepare you or prepare the volunteer to, you know, to answer those seven questions. You'll want to meet in advance. You don't want to walk in there cold. So having a little bit of time for your team to meet together is a way to help make sure the call is going to be successful. You want to, in essence, become the funder. You want to be taking, you know, kind of thinking about thinking about this interaction you're having with them, um, you know, uh, as if you were that particular funder. Um, the, the steps during the meeting itself, take time to make the prospect feel comfortable and relaxed. All right. If you're, if their shoulders are way up like this, <laughs> when you walk in the door, you want to have somebody, right, helping them, hey, ask, hey, what's going on? I understand your son's, you know, going to state in tennis, or, uh, you know, I understand your kid's going to be doing a hoop dance at the powwow uh, on Saturday, or whatever it might be to help them, and you'll see them physically relax. You know, next, you want to make sure that you introduce the campaign, whatever the campaign is. In this case, it was the Building for Cultural Resurgence campaign, but whatever the, whatever the topic of the campaign might be, and lay out the basics of the campaign. How is it, you know, how is the campaign organized? Make them feel like they are intimate, they're aware of these things. And then, of course, making sure that you give them a chance to ask, answer any questions that you might have. I remember one call we made, the guy was watching TV, watching a football game. And we started going through this process. And finally, at a certain point, he turned the TV off. And he we finally has it, had his attention. And then the, the call went through successfully. Okay, you ask questions. You know, they're going to ask you questions like, how is the campaign going? Well, why do you want me or my organization? Why do you think of me as being somebody that might donate? These are the questions. How will the funds that you're asking me for be used? And who else is being asked to contribute? And then has the board and the tribal council contributed and to what degree? And again, that idea that 100% of the council, the board needs to contribute at their ability, within their ability, and a little bit more. <laughs> so a comfortable gift from everybody and a little bit more is typically the rule of thumb. Um, and if the person says, yeah, hey, I could get behind this, right? Then ask the prospect for a specific gift. The volunteers at Port Gamble asked Larry Nakata for $100,000 and they stopped. No more, you know, whatever you can do <laughs> kind of questions or a statement. And Larry Nakata turned to those two volunteers um, and said, I can't do 100000 but I can do $10,000. You can come and pick up the check in two weeks. I appreciate the way you asked me for that gift. That's huge. That's really huge. And of course, those two women that were part of that call were just so excited to come back, right, and go, oh, okay, we can go out and do another call. We can make, we can make another call and ask for a, another gift. Really exciting to watch. And I know it sounds a little, really? But yeah, people do, people do really enjoy the success that comes, especially when they get the training that helps them go forward. And if the response is negative, like, well, we're not sure. We're not, we don't, I don't know. Don't feel like you have to make make the gift or make a request right then and there, they may need some time to think about it. One campaign, we talked with this guy three times, three times, and he asked basically the same questions. But finally, in the third meeting with him, he said he would do 10% of the goal. And that was $180,000. So don't feel like you, if you don't make a, a request for a gift in that first meeting, that you failed. Sometimes it does take more than one meeting. And then, of course, you're going to work to overcome the objectives. Well, I can't give right now. Okay, well, we can ask for you to make a gift. You know, you can make a pledge now and make your gift next year. Sometimes it'll be a two or three year time frame that they can make their gift. Or, you know, if you can't, if you can't give 
um, you know, the gift that we asked for, like Mr. Nakata said, I can't give 100,000. Well, but I could give you 10,000. And again, to mention, he gave, his company gave 50,000 more on top of his personal gift of 10,000. And then I need more time to think about it. Okay, of course. When's a good time to get back to you and set up a specific day to call, call on them again? And always send thank you notes regardless of the outcome of the meeting. Thank you for listening to us and, and considering making a gift. Whatever it is, but yeah, always acknowledge that they gave you their time. Last things to think about, I know we're running a little low on time, <clears throat> maintain enthusiasm. It can take some time to make this, make this happen. So the updates that you do, the, the volunteer dinners that you put on are always a way to keep momentum happening. Even little successes can be shared with the volunteers and the campaign committee in a way that will encourage them. Avoid adding new priorities. Oh, you know, it'd be also, this campaign is going pretty well. Let's add another feature to our campaign. Eh, probably not a good idea. You want to take, you want to keep your focus on the things that you've, to, you've identified as the, as the focus for your, this campaign. Um, donor acknowledgement. Again, keep the, the culture in mind. Keep tribal culture in mind when you think about donor acknowledgement. And donor relations in the future, again, I reiterate that idea that you want to be sure that you don't just stop the campaign. The campaign goes on even after the money is raised. Real quick, special events. Uh, you, some of you already know all about special events. At least six months in advance. Yeah, right. <laughs> Why is this campaign having a special event? Is it to raise funds or share information? Well, it's both. You want to recognize it's both. You've all, I'm sure, been to, a, to an auction, an art auction, where nobody talked about why this auction was being conducted, and people are trying to lowball uh, that beautiful bent wood box or whatever it might be for a little bit of money. You don't want people doing that. If you give them enough information about why, the, why the, this campaign is important, you know, I've been a volunteer auctioneer. I've seen... I've seen things be bid up at or above the fair market value of that item. And that's what you want. And you ha that happens because you're sharing information with people about how this cultural center or this museum or library is so important. The venue, also important. Uh, when we talked about Port Gamble having an event, they thought they'd have, the, they'd have their special event at the gym. You know, at, at Little Boston Harbor, they're on the reservation. And then I said, okay, well, then who should the audience be? Well, the audience should be collectors. I said, so you're going to ask the collectors of, of coastal art, Northwest Coastal Art, to come to the gym at Port Gamble Scalallum? Uh, no. <laughs> no, they said no. So we had the event at the Burke Museum of Natural History on the University of Washington campus there at the University of Washington in Seattle. We had two events at that venue. And the third event was at the Longhouse that they had helped build with their donations. They're, they're buying the tickets and buying the art at the special events. Guess what happened that third year? We invited those people to come to the event at the Longhouse. And 90% of them came across on a ferry from the Seattle area to be part of the third special event in that longhouse. It was beautiful. It was really, really cool. And at the end of that third year special event, they said, well, when's the next event going to be? We want to be sure to be part of that fourth annual special event. So the audience and the venue, those are things you want to think about to make sure that those venues are comfortable for your audience, especially when you can invite them to a new building that they help build with their, with their participation. The last thing I want to say about cost and price, just be sure that you identify what are the total costs of the special event and divide that by the number of people you think will attend, right? That will tell you what it costs for that person to come through the door. And then you better establish your price around that cost. I went to a beautiful special event and they raised zero money because the costs were the same as the price. And so they didn't make any money. That's not a good way to go. So be aware of the costs 
and make sure you adjust your price to reflect what those costs be. So you can make some money based on the cost of people coming through the door. Make the special events a source of continuing support. We call them signature events. You should have this event every year, even after the building is built, to keep those dollars coming in and keep people engaged. Other things to be aware of, just real quickly, uh, this whole idea of grant opening. Be aware of cultural imperatives of your tribe and village. Consult the elders. Well, you know, you all know this. You're, this is your thing. This is, you're involved with this on a regular day-to-day -day basis. But what I'm saying is, oops, what I'm saying is don't go too soon. You know, for example, at the, at the Squawkson, before the building was complete, they had a drumming in ceremony that the, you know, the elders had helped them organize. That was really important to bring the spirit to the building before it was enclosed, that kind of thing. Another tip is engage and involve the youth. That's a really important part uh, to, be, to, be, to, to engage them and involve them because they will be the part, they'll be part of the song and dance group or they'll be part of the group that uses these facilities down the road. Follow the six month rule, definitely make sure you have enough time uh, to plan and have the event, uh, include and acknowledge donors at every chance you get, thanking those donors, including tribal leadership in the process of the grand opening, and have a media plan and make sure somebody's assigned to handle the media who come to your grand opening. Because if you're trying to do that while you're working with the tribal leadership, you know, you can be pulled lots of different ways and you want to give somebody that task of working with the media and making sure that key messaging is built into that process so that the same message is being given to every element of the media who comes to your grand opening. So well, I'm sorry to rush it, and I think we're right up on time, but I do want to take time for questions, and I'm happy to stick around um, to answer any questions that you might have. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All Thank right. you, Don. Okay. That was wonderful. Um, so what questions do we have? I know we had several um, comments in the chat about finding a copy of the presentation um, or any of the supporting documents. And I posted in there the um, web address so you can find that. So if you want to be able to review the slides and everything. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The approaching funders training, like I say, I get, I kind of gave you a quick outline of that. Um, and the main point I want to say about that is it will take people who are somewhat reluctant to getting involved in fundraising and help give them the confidence that they know how to do it. It's, it's not that complex. Uh, and what we do, just to be perfectly uh, candid with you, what we do is we will identify a prospect that we pretty well know is going to make a gift, right? And even if it's a relatively small gift, and we send these new volunteers out to call on that person where the chances of them saying no are almost nil, right? So they go out and they ask Rick and Susan for $500. And sure enough, Rick and Susan make a pledge of $500 toward the campaign. And then that, that gives, it helps give that volunteer the confidence that they can go out and ask for other gifts. So we're not going to send them out if it's, if it's going to be a tough nut to ask for a gift from. We're going to we're going to take those on in a little different way. Yeah, Jessica. Hi. Yeah, I have a question. So um, this is the first time I've ever had any sense of a campaign uh, fundraising um, effort. I mean, obviously, I know they've happened for some of our other projects or other projects in our community, but. Um, this was the first kind of mini in-depth training on it. So I'm a little overwhelmed okay. and I wonder, is this something that we should expect to be completely one staff member's job to coordinate all of this? And if so, you know, what's the time frame for that? Because at this point we have staff members that, or, or council members, we have two of them on the call right now that, you know, do um, this here and that here. And, and so their jobs or their volunteer commitments are, are varied. Um, right. So I, 
I just don't know in terms of planning for a person that leads this, you know, how do we fund that person? Right. And part of the campaign infrastructure, remember, is the P for people. And so part of the work that we do typically when we work with a client is not jump into raising money, but jumping in and making people aware of what we're trying to accomplish and identifying people that say, yeah, I, I could be a part of that and giving them discrete tasks. If you say to somebody, hey, uh, you know, George, would you be willing to help on this campaign? The response is typically, yeah, I could, you know, I could, you know, I could you know, so offer my general support. But if you ask them to be on the research committee or the PR committee or whatever, give them a specific task and you make it clear what they're signing up to do, then you'll be able to broaden that base of people. And I know that oftentimes people within the tribal setting are overextended. There, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of things for them to do. But what I found is retired individuals, for example, within the community will step up. I mentioned Glenn Pascal, who was a retired Vietnam era veteran. He just caught fire. And my gosh, there was, he, we could ask Glenn, oh yeah, no, I can, I can help with that. I can help with that. And so I, there's oftentimes a, a, a reservoir of really dedicated and, and talented people that are just not all that engaged right now. They, they're, they're not aware of what you're trying to do. Uh, and so you're broadening the base while maintaining uh, management control of the situation, right? Your council members, you as a staff member, will ha have that management responsibility to help sort of uh, manage the volunteers. But that first step says, who are the Glenn Pascals or the other, the other others within my community who, you know, ha who believe in this? Um, and sometimes it also involves looking at, for example, Mary John at Port Gamble was the woman who had this 30-year vision of a first longhouse in over 100 years. Well, people within her family were also wanting to carry forward her vision. So going to the John family and saying, you know, we know Mary's past, but we've, we've, we're, we're trying to carry her vision forward to building this longhouse. Would you, as part of the John family, be willing to be part of this campaign to help your great-grandmother's vision come, come, to tr come, come forward in a good way? And yeah, oftentimes, yeah, yeah, I can help. I'll, I'll, I'll make an art piece to sell at the auction. I'll, I'll be part of the special events committee. I'll, I'll help harvest the, the, the timber uh, off the res, whatever it might be. And rec recognize that it's that kind of thing that people, when they make that offer, that's their contribution. And they're part of that hundred member, you know, like I say, a hundred volunteers. Uh, it was amazing to watch that. Having an event at the Burke Museum, we, we literally had probably 75 of those hundred people they're at the event, helping that event go forward. It was really beautiful, really, and, and it built the community. So the campaign raised the $5 million to build the four buildings, but it also increased communication among people within that broader community. That's another, another byproduct of the campaign. So I hope that's, I hope that's helpful, but um, yeah, you, you, there are people within your community that you're not aware of that would be willing to step up. That's the good news. And it's taking that time at the outset to identify them and go out and, and see how they might be able to contribute. And not discounting anybody because, well, they wouldn't, they're not gonna help. <laughs> you, you, you just don't know till you ask. <laughs> the, worst, the worst they can do is say no. <laughs> Other questions that come up? Well, wonderful. I know we've spent an hour and a half of your time. Hopefully it was a good use of your time. And I, I hope that uh, you'll be able to kind of digest this stuff. Yeah, it can be a little overwhelming to hear all this in, an, in 90 minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, rec recognize that oftentimes the workshops that we do, you know, like say the, the approaching funders training is a two, between two and a half to four hour training. And I'll tell you what, people really have fun. The, so I mentioned Suquamish had us come and do that training for them four or five times. And we had repeat customers. We had people that came more than once because they wanted to have that experience and kind of reinforce the lessons that they learned. And then they went back out and, and asked, asked for more gifts. So that was fun. That was fun to watch. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, all everybody, you and so enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll look forward to seeing you. We'll learn more about whether we're going to 
pull together a presentation on the tribal foundation part of it. And if it's of interest to a majority of the cohort, that'll be fine. If not, uh, we'll think of a, maybe another way of sharing that information. So uh, good. Uh, thank you for your, all the good work that you do in your communities. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Don. All right, everyone, have a wonderful week, and we'll, we'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks, Don. You bet. Bye-bye, Don.